And up next, the ruthless world of corporate America is being traced back to one businessman. Former General Electric CEO Jack Welch is the man who broke capitalism in David Gellis's new book. And Walter Isaacson joins David to discuss the legacy of America's first celebrity CEO. David Gellis, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Your book is about Jack Welch, the legendary CEO of uh, General Electric for two decades. But it's also about something larger, and I want to talk about that, which is it's about the destruction of American capitalism. Explain that to me. Well, for the decades, really, after World War II, companies uh, went about their business with a real sense of civic engagement, a real sense that when a company like Johnson & Johnson, for example, was making its products and delivering its services. It was doing so, yes, in the interest of its stockholders, but also for so many other stakeholders, which men, like those who ran Johnson & Johnson and General Electric at the time, identified and called out in their annual report, saying that they ran it for their employees, for their consumers, for the men and women working in their supply chain, and even for the government. They were proud to pay their taxes at the time. Something changed right around 1981, and this change was embodied by men like Jack Welch, and it has led to a world in which very few of those stakeholders are getting the attention that they need and the wealth from the companies that for so long flowed to that large group of stakeholders is largely concentrated now in the shareholders and the executives. So I identify Welch as the man who helped transform this arrangement and gave us the world we have today. You say in the 1950s, corporations cared more about other stakeholders. I was struck in your book that I think it's 1953, you quote the GE uh, annual report. And what does it say the mission of GE is? Well, GE was among many companies during this era that, again, proudly identified the fact that they were running their corporation, yes, for investors, and they were proud to deliver a modest return, but really they saw their success as the country's success, their success as the success of the men and women working in their factories. And they were even proud. They announced that year that it was their biggest payday ever. They were spending more on the cost of labor than ever before. And that was a good thing to them. And I don't need to tell you, that's not the world we live in today. These days, executives at so many companies are focused on reducing labor costs, on reducing the amount of money they pay in taxes, and really amplifying profits for institutional investors and largely for executives who, of course, are compensated in stock these days. So Jack Welch pretty much focused only on shareholder value. Was that the main transformation? Well, it's not just the focus, but it was how he did it. When he arrived at GE in 1981 as CEO, he unleashed a wave of factory closures and mass layoffs that fundamentally destabilized the American middle class. Up until that point, you couldn't point to major American employers using layoffs as a tool to improve profit margins. But all of a sudden, he made it the norm at GE. And what was so important to recognize is that GE was really the standard bearer for corporate America. So what he did at GE became common practice everywhere else. So he did it with downsizing. He did it with financialization as well. He turned GE from an industrial company that, of course, made light bulbs and aircraft engines to a financial company that was making most of its money towards the end of his career from financial products, things like high interest credit cards commercial real estate deals. And that mirrored and helped fuel this transformation of the American economy. And during his tenure, we saw Wall Street become a bigger and bigger part of the American economy. It gets to the heart of a debate we still have, which is, is a corporation supposed to focus really just on shareholder value, making a profit, return on investment, uh, comes out of the Milton Friedman School, as you discuss in your book, or is a corporation supposed to do that, but also look after other stakeholders, such as its community, its country, its workers, its customers? How did Jack Welch help uh, change the way we look at that divide? 
Well, you're absolutely right to call out Milton Friedman, who, of course, in 1970 wrote in the New York Times Magazine that the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. But that was really theory, not only in 1970, but right up until 1981. No one until Welch had the command of a large enough company, the gumption, and frankly, just the will to make that a reality. And there's such a difference, as you know, Walter, between theory and practice. And Jack was the one that put it into practice. But more broadly, I do think you're right to note that there has been this long running debate. And it's, I think of it as a pendulum swinging back and forth. And in the years after World War II, in that golden age of capitalism, which is what some people call it, there was really a stakeholder focus, even if we didn't call it stakeholder capitalism, which is a term that's in vogue today. But it has swung so far in this other direction of shareholder primacy. And I think we're at the beginning of a reassessment, a real re-engagement with that debate of what is the purpose of a corporation. Well, wait, explain to me why Jack Welch and for that matter, Milton Friedman are wrong. I mean, isn't it mainly the responsibility of a company to say, you invest in us and we're going to give you the biggest profit possible? Well, it's important to know that there's no law that specifically outlines what the purpose of a company is. There's no law in the Constitution. The SEC doesn't say that companies have to maximize But, but can shareholders sure. sue if you're violating a fiduciary duty to give them as much profit as possible? No, there's actually a huge misconception that there is some law to maximize short-term profits. There's a fiduciary duty, of course, but they don't specify exactly what form that takes. And importantly, on what time horizons we're talking about. And Jack Welch, no doubt, was a master of maximizing short-term returns. And he did so, so effectively that GE became the largest, most valuable company in the world during his tenure. And we can't take that away from him, but he did it to an extreme. And in doing so, in being so myopically focused on quarterly results, on short-term results, he essentially hollowed out the company. Research and development withered. They started getting into short-term financial instruments that ultimately came back to haunt them when the financial crisis hit. And this is what so much of our company, our economy, excuse me, looks like. Decision after decision to maximize short-term quarterly profits at the expense of the long-term well-being, not only of the corporation, but of communities, of individual employees, and of, I would argue, our society. I think this focus on short-term profits has had a cascading long-term effect, not only on the, the companies themselves, but really on the fabric of our nation, which of course is, is, is in pretty sorry shape these days. So you think that this focus on short-term profits sort of undermine job security, the notion of a prosperous middle class in this country. And in some ways, I think you're right, it leads to Donald Trump and other things. When you look at some of the disaffected pockets across the middle of the United States of America, these are towns where factories and GE factories in particular once thrived. One of the things Welch did was not just go about downsizing with layoffs, but he embraced offshoring and outsourcing to the extreme. He was really one of the first CEOs to famously say if he could, he would have every factory on a barge. So it would just be a floating stateless entity that could chase cheap labor and favorable exchange rates all over the world, wherever it, he could go. That speaks to his real lack of interest in the communities in which GE operated its factories. And when you look across the country and see the erosion of good, high quality jobs in town after town, the erosion of the tax base that those kind of factories supported, it's not hard to understand just how damaging this has been over the long term. I even asked Jeff Immel. Jack Welch's successor about this when I interviewed him for the book. And he understood it. He said, listen, I get it. When someone is making 35 something dollars an hour at a GE factory and they lose their job for whatever reason, and they wind up making $13 an hour at a contractor, that not only has a damaging effect on, on that individual and that individual's 
family and community, but it erodes a sense of trust in business. And so when people ask, why doesn't you know, business have more credibility with everyday Americans these days, it's decisions like this compounded over decades that I think we can fairly point to and say, this is a part of the problem. After Jack Welch left, GE collapsed pretty much. Was it because Jack Welch left or was it because of what he did before he left? A lot of things happened right when Jack Welch left. And it was a combination of, I would argue, underinvestment in some of the core research and development uh, that made GE great for so much of the 20th century. But also it's important to note, he, his last day on the job was September 8th. 2001. Three days later, the world changed in all sorts of ways that we know and had a cascading effect on GE that Jeff Immelt, his successor, had to deal with. But it's important to note that Jeff Immelt himself, several years after taking over, candidly reflected and took a hard look at the company he had inherited. And I can't use the words he used, on this program, but he said he did not like what he saw at all and understood that the company was not as strong as it appeared from those quarter after quarter results. In fact, it was a lot of short term focus that was making the stock look really good. But in the long run, as Jeff Immelt found out, the company had real fatal problems that he had to deal with and that a succession of CEOs have tried and failed to fix since. And just last year, it was announced that General Electric, founded in the 1800s, was finally going to be broken up once and for all. There are half as many manufacturing jobs in America as there were when Jack Welch took over GE. To what extent does he bear some responsibility for that and for the type of CEO that is doing things like that? Well, globalization was coming for the United States, no doubt about it, right? Whether Jack went on his tear of downsizing and offshoring and outsourcing that gave him the name Neutron Jack, this was a moment in the early 80s when the industrialized economies of Japan and Germany were coming back, you know, roaring back after World War II and their rebuilding process. So there was going to be more competition on the global stage, no doubt about it. Welch, however, reacted in the extreme. It's a counterfactual to imagine what it would have looked like had he found ways to double down on American manufacturing, to resist the temptation to just chase cheap labor. We won't know. We can't know the answers to that. But what's clear is that there are plenty of other prosperous countries that have strong manufacturing bases. So it's impossible to know exactly to what extent he could have done things differently. But there is no doubt in my mind and no doubt from the data that he was a driving force in letting American jobs move overseas, especially in the 1980s. To your second question, to what extent is he responsible for other CEOs' behavior? I think it's impossible to underestimate his influence on other CEOs. As I mentioned, GE was one of the most influential companies for decades. It was the place other companies, other boards went to, not just to get a sense of how they ought to behave, but it was the place they went to to recruit other CEOs. And more than two dozen of Jack Welch's direct protégés went on to run other major American companies, companies like 3M, Boeing, Home Depot, Chrysler. And time and again, when his protégés went to those companies, they followed the same playbook of using downsizing, finance, and deal-making to prop up the stock in the short term, often leaving the country and the companies poorer for it in the long run. When I worked at Time Incorporated, uh, we, our mandate came from the will of Henry Luce, that was the founder, who said the company should be operated both in the public interest and in the interest of shareholders. And he said that good executives would have to balance the tension there. Then when it merged with Time Warner, suddenly they were imitating Jack Welch and asking managers like me to fire 10% of the workforce each year by trying to identify the lowest performing 10%. Uh, it was also a company that got financialized, as you say. So do you think this was a trend coming after Jack Welch? It's just so powerful to hear you 
have had your own personal experience it. In the week or so since this book has been published, I keep hearing stories about this over and over, and I hadn't heard it turning up in Time Warner, but there it is. And that is absolutely the legacy of Jack Welch. What you just mentioned, that bottom 10% notion, that was an innovation, I would argue a, a rather dark one, that he pioneered in the 1980s. He called it the vitality curve, which is this sort of euphemistic term for firing the bottom 10% of your workers every single year. Other people called it stack ranking, or I think most accurately, rank and yank. Managers had to put their employees into three categories, 20% in the top, 70% in the middle, 10% in the bottom, and that bottom 10% got shown the door ruthlessly and relentlessly year after year. But it wasn't just Jack and it wasn't just GE. He started it, but it didn't end there. It continued at so many other countries, companies, excuse me, including Microsoft under Steve Ballmer. And even more recently, it was showing up at places like Uber and WeWork in just the past few years. The era of Jack Welch from the 1980s and 1990s coincided with the end of manufacturing in the United States as a major force, a deindustrialization of uh, the United States. Do you think that manufacturing and industrial production can come back to the United States now? It's going to be different, of course, but we're starting to see it come back. We're seeing even companies like Apple invest in real manufacturing operations in the United States. And what's what's exciting to me about this is that these are not low quality manufacturing jobs. These are incredibly high quality, high tech, sophisticated manufacturing jobs. And it, it, it tells me that there is an opportunity right here for CEOs who want to invest in their people, who want to invest in the United States and who want to help share the massive wealth created by these corporations with some of the people of this country, there is a golden opportunity to do it right now. And I think given the state of the world, it's becoming all the more clear that between supply chains and rapidly shifting strategic relationships, there's also just a national security imperative to trying to make sure that America can be a strong manufacturing economy, in addition to all the other amazing things that we're able to do. David Gallus, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.